Hey guys, here is a summary video of everything you need to know for AQA Biology cell structure. Now if you want to fill in the diagrams as we're going along, you can get those through my free revision guide which is over my website, or you can get it from Amazon. Here we have our beautiful plant cell with a cell membrane that's responsible for determining which bits go in and out of the cell. A cell wall, important for structure. The vacuole, important for structure. The cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place. The tiny little dots are the ribosomes which are responsible for protein synthesis. The green bits are the chloroplasts. The pink ones are the mitochondria, where um, energy is produced. And then last but not least, we have our nucleus. Here we have our animal cell with our cell membrane. Again, controlling what goes in and out, our mitochondria. where energy is produced, ribosomes, which are responsible for protein synthesis, cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place, and our nucleus, where is the, that's where the DNA is held, and that's the control centre of the cell. You'll notice there are several features of a plant cell that an animal cell doesn't share. For example, the cell wall, the vacuole, the chloroplasts. If you want to copy these pictures yourself, you can download them in the free version guide from my website. Here we have our bacterial cell, which has its cell membrane, controlling what goes in and out. The cytoplasm, where most of the reactions take place. The chromosome, the DNA, not in a nucleus. The flagella, which is used for um, locomotion. Ribosomes for protein synthesis. And then on the outside, we have the cell wall. Even though you have to learn the structure of a typical plant cell or a typical animal cell, there isn't really a typical type of cell because there are a wide range of differentiated specialised cells. We can see here in our cross section of the leaf, it has lots of different types of cells in. Here we have a neuron, which looks very different to a muscle cell, which is going to look very different to a skin cell or very different to a set of cells in the gut. They're going to be specialized to do their jobs. So here we have villi, which give us long surface area. Here the cells are very tall to provide structure. Here, the cells have a very long body so that the neurons can travel a long distance. And the muscle cells are going to stretch and contract. All cells start off looking the same. So they have your basic cell structure. And then various different genes will be turned on and turned off. And that's when it will start to specialise. That's when differentiation will take place and it will grow this really, really long axon or it will grow the villi or it will turn into a leaf cell. Mycoscopy techniques have varied wildly over the time. From the very, very basic starts where you had your lenses and you had to use the focus to see what was going on. These are all generally hand done, very, very basics. To ones that you're probably more familiar with in school which have slightly more sophisticated lenses to the massive ones that I used to work on, um, electron microscopes, where they're all controlled by computer. If you want to work out image heights, object heights or magnification from an image you've taken from a microscope, the calculation is magnification equals image height over object height. Bacteria divide very, very quickly from 1 into 2 into 8. 4 into 8 into 16. A good bacteria, a happy bacteria, a bacteria that's got lots of nutrients and is happy with what it's doing will divide roughly every 20 minutes. So that very, very quickly you'll go from one bacteria to millions of bacteria. 
so that you can become very ill from um, ingesting, from getting in the cuts, from getting your skin, just a single bacteria because they divide very, very rapidly. If you want to produce an uncontaminated culture of bacteria, moving your bacteria from one place to another, you first need to flame your inoculation loop so that it is red hot. This makes sure it kills everything that is on there. You need to make sure that you open your bottles near the flame so that no further contamination can get in there. Open the lid as little as possible, flaming the lid as you go. Work as quickly as possible to transfer the sample of bacteria that you've picked up into your uncontaminated broth. And working as quickly as possible so that you don't get any other bacterial contamination. You can then leave the sample at um, 37 degrees if you've got an incubator or just leave it on the bench at 25 degrees um, for a few days and your bacteria will grow. I've done a much longer video explaining this, as you can see in set here, if you want to go and have a look at that, it's in the playlist with all of the other required practicals. When we are going to be looking at the effect of antibiotics or antiseptics on how bacteria grow, we need to make sure that our work area and our hands are clean. Because even though these um, bacteria are relatively safe to use, we have to assume they're going to be pathogenic. You need to make sure you've labelled the underside, not the lid, of the agar plate. And these plates will probably already be seeded for you by the technician. You can put your little filter paper discs on there, use forceps to do this, and then incubate them at 25 degrees for 48 hours. We can then, me we can then measure the clear zones in two different directions. Here the clear zone is slightly hard to see, but... Hopefully, if you look close enough, you can see it. It's better if you measure the diameter, but in this case, the only thing that I could do was to measure the radius because the clear zone was so large. DNA is a long strand of deoxyribonucleic acid made up of lots of letters, A's, T's, C's and G's. And these twist round into a double helix. This double helix is still ridiculously long, so it further twists round so that it's in a chromosome. And this chromosome is located in the nucleus of a cell. In mitosis, we go from one parent cell to two identical daughter cells. The first thing that needs to happen is that the DNA in the nucleus needs to condense into chromosomes, and then they need to line up down the middle. Once they're all lined up down the middle and all the checks are taken place to make sure that um, chromosomes aren't going to go astray, they can start to be pulled apart to either end of the cell. New nuclei will form and then they will separate into two identical daughter cells. Stem cells are fantastic things because they are things that have the potential to turn into any other type of cell. They have a number of different uses. For example, if you're treating Parkinson's disease, they can be used to grow new brain cells. If we're talking about brain or spinal injury, bone injuries, then they can be used to grow new bones to fill the gap. If we have organ failure, we can grow new organs or parts of organs instead of waiting and making someone wait on the incredibly long transplant waiting list. If we want to make stem cells, then we take a nuclei out of an egg cell we take nuclei from the patient's uh, cell and insert that into the empty egg. The egg can then start to develop into an embryo. From this embryo, the stem cells are then removed and stem cells are turned into new cells. This does come with quite a lot of controversy because human embryos are going to be created and then destroyed. Um, and there are lots of religious objections to this. People just saying that life um, starts when embryos are created and people that object to the destruction of embryos. When we're talking about diffusion, we are talking about things moving from a high concentration down the diffusion gradient to an area of low concentration. 
This could be things moving from an area inside a cell where they've been made to another area, or it could be things moving out of a cell. For example, it could be um, happening in the lungs, so these are the alveoli, the air spaces, and this is the capillary travelling around it. These are very, very thin uh, walls, only one cell thick, and carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the blood into the lungs so they can be breathed out, and oxygen is going to diffuse from the lungs into the blood so it can be taken around the body. All this can be in the gut. These are the villi of the gut. This is the gut cavity here. And you notice, again, they are one cell thick. And just like the LBI, they have a very large surface area. We're going to get digested food moving from the gut cavity into the blood so that it can be taken around the rest of the body. So diffusion is the movement of gases or any particles that dissolved in solution moving down a concentration gradient from a high concentration to an area of low concentration. Osmosis is specifically the movement of water through a partially permeable membrane from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So you notice this partially permeable membrane, the uh, pores in it aren't large enough for the um, solute to move through, so the water is going to be the one that moves through here. This sort of thing can happen in root hair cells where we're looking at the uptake of water. Active transport again is a movement across a membrane but it's from this time a low concentration to a high concentration against the concentration gradient. So our channel, our active transport channel, is going to pick up something that it wants. It is then going to move that through the channel to the other side. This could happen, for example, when we're talking about glucose in the gut or minerals in roots.